I'm ready to begin now, Heidi. Oh, we are recording. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. And first, as always, I want to say thank you to Hoboken Public Library for being such an awesome library and allowing us to do these art at home classes. I don't know about you attendees of the class, but for me, this is an important way for me to connect with others during this horrible time of isolation. The arts are such a great way to escape the period of pandemic that we are currently still living through. We are going to celebrate another woman today during Women's History Month. And her name, her name is Lee Krasner. Lee Krasner, many of you I'm sure have heard of before. Uh, she's probably most famous for being the wife of Jackson Pollock, um, but that's the least of what she did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she and Pollock definitely influenced each other. Um, they certainly worked together. They were both in the, the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, during the Depression years, but they also worked with a lot of other artists. So Krasner was uh, born in 1908 in Brooklyn. She is an American abstract expressionist painter. She has a specialty in collage. Um, and she did do a lot of interdisciplinary work between collage and painting. She frequently cut up her own paintings and rejoined them and painted on top of the collages that she created. She was really a transitional figure uh, in 20th century art. She became a bridge between early abstractionist painting and later abstractionist painting, pre and post-war abstract painting in the United States. Her early training started at the Women's College of Cooper Union. Yes, way back in the day, Cooper Union was divided into a female and male college. Uh, her parents were Jewish Russian immigrants from Russia. And um, she grew up poor in Brooklyn. She was the fourth of five children. She loved art from a very young age. She went to Washington Irving High School for girls, uh, primarily because they offered a major in art. Then she did go to Cooper Union on scholarship. She went to the National Academy of Design in 1928 and then finished there in 1932. She was gifted in representational art. This is probably a little known fact about her, but boy, she could draw the human figure. She uh, did incredibly Baroque representations of the human figure that were renowned for their uh, realistic recreation of people. In fact, she was um, almost rejected from the National Academy of Art because no one could quite believe that a female could do what she was doing in figurative work. All right, there's so much to say about her. She met a seminal artist Hans Hoffman in 1937. Hans Hoffman, those of you who've been with me for many, many years will remember, Hans Hoffman was an abstract artist, came from Europe to the United States where he was a major influence on many American artists. He was an abstract artist who 
revolutionized American art by having artists value the two-dimensional plane. So he was one of the first artists to introduce American artists into thinking about the flat surface as being beautiful in its own right. He helped artists to see beyond the need to recreate and represent three-dimensional form on the flat two-dimensional surface. But he was a geometric abstractionist. He started with shape he started with real objects and abstracted from them. So she studied with Hoffman for several years, really loved working with him. She worked either from life, either a nude or a still life that Hoffman had available to the students. And she would then render what she was looking at in an abstract way, a more cubist abstract way. <clears throat> but then she joined the WPA during the Great Depression and that's where she met Pollock along with other people who really influenced her heavily. De Kooning, Wilhelm de Kooning, Arshield Gorky, Franz Klein, Adolf Gottlieb, Mark Rothko, Barnett Newman, Clifford Still, etc. cetera, et cetera. And that's when she lost her interest in hard edge abstraction and began working in what we call abstract expressionism, which is more gestural abstraction, where the artist becomes more interested in the gesture of the arm, the movement of the body in the application of the paint to the page. Everybody with me so far? Throughout her life, she would go back and forth between her love for the geometric abstraction of Hoffman's um, period when she worked with Hoffman and the very gestural work of abstract expressionism. They both had a strong pull for her and you can see it in her work. All right, any thoughts, any additional well, stuff you might want to add before we start looking at her work? I had a question, Liz. Go for it. Hi, it's Jane. Hi, Jane. Good hey. morning. So I was just wondering if we are in a period now where the concept of the WPA, you know, the, the rollback in our economy is going to give us a time to reflect and, and create once again and support artists in a, in a different way, support the, you know, the living of, of our artwork and our, you know, our creativity. Are you asking me, is that gonna happen? I'm asking uh, you to, to comment on that if you have any thoughts about it, because you, you, know, you have such a depth of knowledge about the history and you know, being an artist for so many years. Well, um, I think that some of that has been happening, but I would say more in the dramatic arts and maybe in the world of music. I'm not seeing a lot of that happening in visual arts at the moment, unfortunately. What I will say is, and this has been a growing trend in the world of visual arts, even way before the pandemic, artists now seem to be part community activists slash visual artists. And we have talked about that um, there's an artist, for example, named Theaster Gates, who has bought up whole blocks of dilapidated buildings that he's turning into community art space. Um, so there's a lot of that kind of activity going on in the visual arts world. But I haven't seen a whole lot of government um, 
WPA types of projects. I have to be honest. Gotcha. Thank you. That was helpful. I appreciate your comments on that. You're welcome. I mean, there could be stuff going on that I don't know about. If anybody finds out about stuff like that, I would love to know more. Well, I think your comment about the merging of um, activism and art is, is really um, important. And uh, so it isn't, it isn't that people are, are dedicated solely to art as expression, but they're merging those uh, merging those uh, imperatives. I, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, there could be stuff in the visual arts that I'm unaware of. I would hate to say no. Let's see what the new administration is going to bring to us. All right, so any other comments? I'm starting to open up some of Lee Krasner's work for us to look at. I'm gonna first open up some of her more Hoffman inspired work, her earlier work. And let's see if the share screen is gonna Cooperate today? Yes. And if everyone could please mute, I hear some feedback going on. And good morning, Karen just entered and I failed to Say good morning to everyone. Yikes. Good morning and welcome as always. I'm so delighted to see everybody today. I think I did welcome everybody when we were off camera. So a hearty welcome, second welcome to everyone. Oh, excuse me one moment. Someone's trying to get in who can't. Okay, forgive me. So you can see, doesn't this look like a still life? In fact, this kind of looks like a bowl of fruit down here. Maybe this is, I don't know, a lamp, who knows? So this is more in the vein of what we call geometric abstraction or cubism. There's very little, um, brush stroke visible, although Krasner always loved this thick textural effect in her work. She was not shy about showing brush stroke. So there is some of that. The very thick outlining of the shapes also shows that she's still rooted in celebrating the shapes that she's looking at. Notice how flat the picture frame is. Very little use of shading, no attempt at creating a three-dimensional uh, image. There really is no depth of field. You don't get the sense that there's a foreground or a background. There is a little bit of movement back into space because of the way she's arranged the composition the kind of twist from this bottom corner all the way back to the top. It's pretty amazing. It almost looks like an easy chair or something. And I don't see a table, but it looks like kind of like a wing back chair with the bowl of fruit. Could be. This to me reads like a table, Lauren, down here. Oh, yeah. Okay, now this I see it. This could be a leg, this could be a leg, but who knows? And does it really even matter? Liz, I'm wondering what you, th is, is the, uh, the outlining of the shapes in black, is that 
is that typical or is that like a I see it it looks very purposeful and then there are just a couple of thinner lines but I was just wondering about that I think it's a device she's using a compositional device that she's using to emphasize the shapes are you asking is it typical of cubism yeah I was just wondering if it's um yeah just how where it fits because I'm you know I'm kind of a blank canvas with some of the history um I think you'll often see outlining in cubism certainly uh Brock and Picasso used outlining would I say that yeah. it's typical I I can't answer that I don't know. That that would require further research. I invite <laughs> you to look into that some more. All right, no worries. Hoffman, Hans Hoffman definitely used outlining quite a bit. I'm just so taken with the power of this composition. Again, fabulous negative shape in the gray shapes of the background. Don't you love it? I do. I love the texture. You were speaking of the strokes. I love right. that texture. Right. And then this one red circle. And this tiny gray triangle. And then this other little, what is this yellow triangle up here? Pretty cool. Triangles definitely play a key role in this piece. In color, the yellow balances. Yes, that's another, another interesting thing about Krasner is she flip-flops between a very colorful palette and sometimes a monochromatic palette. And she went through different periods where she used earth tones as opposed to colorful uh, works of art. She had a, an Earth Green series from 1956 to 1959. Um, the Earth Green series was right before Pollock's death. And according to what I'm reading, they reflect her feelings of anger, guilt, pain, and loss in their, their relationship. He was a very difficult man to live with. Um, she had an Umber series from 1959 to 1961. She had a primary series in the 1960s where she's using very, very bright colors. So she moves in and out of the use of bright colors. I'm glad you noticed that, Margot. All right, let's look at some other stuff. You know what, I realized I don't have any from her Umber series. I should have, but so be it. She was really prolific. If you like her work, I invite you to look for more. This piece is a, what I would call a little more monochromatic. See what you think. <clears throat> oh, I love the red. Isn't it? It really, really pops. So now we have moved from the more geometric abstraction to the more expressionist work. I want to talk a little bit about expressionism. It looks very haptic, rushed, thoughtless, careless, as if the artist is just literally throwing the paint at the canvas. 
And I want to say, yes, there's probably some of that. Maybe in the initial part of the process, she was very quick and non-thinking in her approach. But as she got more involved with the piece, she started making decisions, choices. Where did she put that red? Why did she put the red where she put it? What was she trying to achieve with the dark lines? Notice how the lines have a particular movement throughout the entire canvas. The red is just in certain places. So she was making decisions as she went. We always have this vision, particularly of her husband, Jackson Pollock. You've probably all seen the movie where he laid the canvas on the floor and he's just dumping the paint on the canvas. And he had the, the giant house paintbrush tied to a broomstick and he's just having fun swishing it all around. But this is a myth. Even though he might have and she might have worked quickly, they were stepping back, they were looking at their work, they were making decisions as they went. They were thinking about the composition. What worked? What made an impact? What looked good with what? I find this to be extremely organic. Um, I'm reading I'm reading a book on mycelium, which is a structure for fungus. And I just saw a, an image last night that looks so much like this. I don't know if you can see it, but. Is this Jane? We could spotlight. Well, after I stop the share. We yes, exactly. Spotlight. It's just so funny that it's, you know, it struck me that I was just uh, looking at this last night and there is something about looking at organic structures and just letting them into your mind. And then looking at this, it struck me in the same way. Well, I'm thrilled that you brought that up because I'm going to suggest, and if you got my email and had time to read it, one of the things I'm gonna suggest you look at is a plant for your starting point. Because, Hoff, um, well, Hoffman too, but um, Krasner was influenced by nature. So often she would start by looking at plant forms before she began her work. So thank you for mentioning that. My pleasure. There, it has a meditative quality. Okay, wonderful. For me, it has the reverse. I find this painting very agitated. I see faces in it. <laughs> I see faces also. Was that Heather? Yes. Yeah, over here, if you can see. Yes, Earth. yes. And then to the, uh, well, my right of it, there's like a profile, like a, it looks like a woman's face almost. I also saw the face too. I Wonder. see faces throughout the whole painting and then one larger one Right here, this big oval? Yes. I would hazard a guess that that was not intentional, but what do I know? You could also say there are dancing figures in there as well. Why not? I mean, you could see that. Here's, for me, here's a leg, perhaps. Here's another leg. Yep. Wonderful comments. All right, let's look at one or two yeah. more pictures and then we're going to go to work. Yeah. Oh. Oh. So many choices. I always have such a hard time.
picking. Okay, we're gonna go with this baby. And Jane will share your mycelium in a bit. Let's look at Krasner's work first. So I'm, this is a little bit of a mix between her earlier and later. You can see the Hoffman influence on this piece. It's very strong. But you can see that she's starting to break away from the rigidness of the geometric figures with the very noticeable brush strokes, the striations, the line action. I love this painting. This painting to me is so reminiscent of my childhood and the whole aesthetic of the 1950s. The colors are perfectly balanced and the shapes too. Yes. How much do, do we love this black curve here? and the way it's mirrored by this thicker black shape. Am I alone in seeing quite a bit of movement in this or? No, I also see movement. Luscious, luscious color. I'm also interested in the way she has, she's treated the background, the, the negative space, if you will, there are shapes and there are, you know, there's intention back there. Um, yeah, and then she, all of a sudden she'll kind of, she'll take something and incorporate it into the, the piece. Yeah. So the purple that, res, that, yeah. So some of it looks like background, some of it looks like it's in between background and part of the shapes. Yep. I like her use of complementary colors. The lavender makes you feel really relaxed and then you have all this action coming at you. So I agree. So, and I like the brush strokes, that feathering. Yeah. Beautiful. Is anyone who did the cardinal painting thinking of birch trees <laughs> on the left there? The yes. <laughs> Yeah, reminds me of Mad Men. This could be an illustration for a 1950s liquor advertisement or something. But it's way more beautiful than that. All right. Let's find something a little more expressionist if I have it. Liz, were these as large as like Pollock's paintings? Yeah, they're pretty big. I, um, these are the kinds of questions I should anticipate and I always forget, sorry. Uh, I always forget to do the research, sorry, Heather, but her paintings are large. I don't know the exact dimensions. So this is now we're in her more umber palette, except for the reds. More organic. More of the expressionism, but still married to shape. 
over texture, although there's really a lot of texture. This is a collage. This is a mixture of collage and paint. Love this piece. Love the dark background. Let's look at a bunch of pictures quickly. How's that? Yes, I'm sorry. When you say amber, what do you mean? Umber is umbers and ochres. I'll put in, uh, I can't do chat box right now, but as soon as I stop this share, I'll type it in for you. But the umbers and ochres are the earth tones. So this is an umbery color. This, this is what we call a yellow ochre. The orange kind of classifies as an umber tone. Any of the dirt colors, let's say. The grayish black background, I think of as an umbery. The more neutral colors. So the reds obviously don't qualify, although there's a red umber, a red ochre and a raw umber. Those are earth tones. They're my favorite colors on earth. So let me type that into the chat box for everyone. They're great colors to learn about. Umbers and ochres. And you can get them in any medium. Raw umbers, red and yellow ochres. You can get brown ochres, brown umbers. Is burnt umber still a color? Burnt umber, I forgot. I love this glass. You keep me on my toes. Okay, I want to look at just, I wish there was a way I could share multiple images at once. Oops, no, that's not what you want, Lizard. Maybe there is. You could send the link and we could all look at it on our own. Well, I have a whole folder full of but they're tiny then, that's the problem. So I'm, I'm just gonna throw up pictures rapidly for you to look at. So you can see how varied her work was. Again, more in the geometric realm. So I'm gonna do this quickly, sorry. Ah, this one, you're gonna love this one, I hope. This one is more expressionist. This to me is, is really represent, re representative of Krasner's style. Liz, this so is the very only one. organic. What? I'm sorry. This is the only one I've seen. It's called Celebration. And talk about size. I think it's about seven feet by 16 feet. So it's pretty it's huge. huge. <laughs> it's huge. I don't where know where it is. Is it MoMA? Uh, no, no, I just remember it from one of my art books. So, uh, oh, okay. But uh, I looked at it and I go, wow, I've got to go see this. When the museum's open. I think it may be at MoMA. Anybody remember seeing it? 
It's in a private collection. That's all I know. So unless it's on loan. Oh, okay. Then probably it's not at MoMA. But this is really the kind of work that she's most famous for. It's at the Cleveland Museum of Art. Way to go, Lauren. Thank you. Thanks, no Lauren. <laughs> it's because you're young and the computer's intuitive for you. <laughs> yes, I, I must admit that did not come from my brain. It came from Google. Um, but look at all the texture, all the brush stroke, all the... Look at the way she uses black. This is really intentional. Someone was asking before whether her marks are intentional. I believe these black lines are incredibly intentional. The white areas where it looks like she's almost erasing color, those are intentional. She's really thinking about what she's doing as she goes. This is not just this kind of sloppy, sloppy action. She's aware of what she's doing. She may lay a quick groundwork first, but then she goes back in to work on certain areas of the painting to emphasize things. All right, any well, final comments? And then I just, we gotta get to work because we're running out of time. I was I just gonna point out she's using compliments colors again red absolutely the red and the green work beautifully together I like that the black lines don't separate the painting like the painting is moving back and forth but obviously there are those definitive lines but it doesn't feel like you're stuck in any one place or it's separating anything it just it flows beautifully and um and with purpose <laughs> Yes, it, once again, there's a lot of motion in this painting. For me, so much of it works outwards. Agreed. I have this feeling of a garden. Everything's blowing in the wind. I feel like there's some roses popped in there. I can't believe yeah, you said yeah. Do you These see those? I feel tulip. For me, it's more a tulipy thing going on. But it could be roses. I when see tulips as well. And a face in the top left corner. Yes. Liz, does she name her works? Um, yes. Often number one, number two, number three, et cetera, et cetera, though. Okay. Let's talk about what we're going to make today. And welcome, Helen. Helen, I know you've been texting me, but I've been so busy teaching. Sorry. Sorry, I have not been able to reply to your text. That's okay. Are you good? Yeah. Okay, you. good. Sorry. So, Helen, just an update that all the supplies for the weaving class have not arrived yet, and uh, they may have to postpone the weaving class. Just so oh. you know, I will keep everyone informed. Don't worry. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So today, we are going to make an abstract piece of art. If you have paint, it really is the easiest way to create an abstraction. You can, as um, Krasner did, you can create a collage. I recommend that you have something as your starting point, some kind of inspirational object or thing to look at to help you jumpstart your ideas. I also recommend that you start with a bunch of thin washes that you maybe stick with a family of colors. In other words, you stay in blue-green territory or red-yellow family. You want to limit your choices because you're going to be making a lot of decisions. Any questions so far? When you start, try and let go of inhibitions 
just think about covering the paper. After about 10, 15 minutes, stop, step back from your work area, look at what you've created, and then start thinking about how to pull the different areas of your painting together. Are you, gonna, are you going to do it by strategic placement of color? Are you going to do it with lines? Are you going to do it by defining shapes and outlining? Are you going to do it by adding additional texture? So here's what you need to do first. Get your paper, lay it out on your table, Get your paint set up in your palette. Get your water and brushes. You need a variety of size brushes. You want the largest brushes you have for the background for the first run on your piece. Smaller brushes for when you're working on the composition later. Even tinier brushes for detail work and finishing touches. If you are doing collage, obviously you're gonna need a lot of different papers and scissors and glue. Are we using acrylic? I'm gonna use acrylic because the beauty of acrylic with abstract work, you can start thin and build up with a lot of thick layers. Now, uh, Krasner liked to use thick paint. She did a technique called impasto where she laid very thick layers of paint on her work. That's why it was so textural or why it is so textural in its appearance. You can do abstract expressionism with watercolor paint. It's quite beautiful. You can do it with tempera. You can do it with crayon. So whatever you have available to you is fine. Now, inspiration. A house plant, a bowl of bananas or lemons, anything around your house that you think might be interesting for you to look at. If you're doing geometric abstraction, then I would start first by laying down a very light pencil drawing of the shapes that you want to focus on. Very light. And you want to flatten those shapes down. So for example, if you're looking at a lemon, you just want to do an oval, a flat oval. Don't think of it as three-dimensional, just Simplify it down, purify it down to its simplest shape. Any questions? Jane, do you want to hold up the picture of your mycelium? I'm going to highlight Jane because I think if you have a picture, a picture is another good thing to use as your starting point inspiration. Gosh, these are beautiful. Wow. How funny, I see an eye in the bottom one, but that might be because I'm drawing eyes today. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone see that? Jane, I love your polish, by the way, mama. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, beautiful color. Yes, I see an eye here. And I almost see a skull above that in the bottom of the top one and like lightning or something, but. So I'm gonna put the spotlight back on me, Jane, cause I wanna show folks a picture that I found in the New York Times. Those of you who, who might've gotten the Sunday Times, this is kind of a depressing picture if you know what it's about, but it's visually beautiful. Can you all see it? Oh yeah, very nice. So oh, wow. I, might, I might use this as my starting point it was an article about how the um, Gulf Stream may be changing 
In fact, all the currents in the oceans of the world may be changing because of climate change. So photographs are another good starting point for inspiration today. All right, so take a few minutes to get all your supplies. I'm gonna be laying out my palette and then I will start working on my own piece. If you want to watch me, you may. Otherwise, go to work. And we're supposed to draw something first? Margo, I'm suggesting that if you're doing the geometric abstraction where you're starting with shapes. Okay. You do not have to do that. That's a suggestion. Got it. Please don't hesitate to ask questions. This is my favorite part. My head is always cut off. It must be so funny in the YouTube video, but I don't know what to do about that. I keep trying to make the laptop higher. I'm gonna add one more layer. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> closer. Now laying out my palette, which will take me a minute. I don't like to do it in advance because acrylic paints dry out so quickly. <laughs> Putting out the three primaries, red, yellow, and blue first.
Just a suggestion, I would not lay out black on your palette till the very end. But that's my personal working style. I love black so much, I tend to overuse it. I'm going to ask at this point if everybody could please mute. Thanks. If you have questions, you can always unmute. All right, so I'm ready to begin. I'm gonna start with thin washes. And I like doing this because it enables me to build up as I go. So similar to the way we were doing the watercolor portraits last time, if you start out thin, you can always Make it thicker. I think I'm actually gonna ignore that picture I was looking at. My, my mind is going in a different direction now.
Again, I'm starting very quickly. Not really thinking too much at this point. The reds are going to dominate, though, I think. <laughs> Do remember, after a few minutes of the fun playtime, to stand back and look at the whole piece and start making decisions about how to unify the different parts. How are you going to pull this work together? I'm still using my largest brush because I'm getting the big shapes down first. My color is starting to get a bit darker and more intense and thicker. I'm letting the paint drip. More texture coming in. you're going to get a sense of how really difficult the abstraction is. It has this reputation of being something that looks so easy, but really, because there's so much to think about, so many decisions to make, so many challenges, I 
think you need those good mushrooms. Ha <laughs> ha. In more ways than one. So my paper is starting to dry out, which means I can get much thicker with the application of my paint.
forgot to say, get paper towels. I hope everybody remembered. Some of those available. Mine is evolving into something figurative, and I've decided to go with that. Wasn't my intention, but seems pretty inescapable at this point, and that's okay. I'm going to play with that. I'm adding darker and thicker color to emphasize the figurative quality. See what happens. We will see what happens. Hello? Hello? Somebody have a question? I, I can't hear what yes. you're saying. Yes, Helen. Helen, okay. Yes. yes. If you use ketchup and mustard, what does it do? Can you get a little closer to your phone? Because I can't hear what you're saying. You use ketchup and mustard. Why not? Yeah. What does that do? What color comes out? Do brown, right? Yeah, you should get a beautiful brown, a reddish oh, okay. brown. Okay. Try right. it. Thank you. All right. Do it and send me the okay. JPEG, please. I bet it's going to be beautiful. I'm jealous. Right. Make it taste good on Thank a hot you. dog, too. We should have a class one day where we just use food. <laughs> Seriously. Ooh. 
So now I'm taking my smallest brush to do a little bit of line action, but I'm also taking a medium sized brush to de-emphasize if I think I've done the line a little bit too dark. I can de-emphasize and then I can always go back over it if I want. Yeah, I think that's too strong. So. colors. Constantly walking away from my painting so that I can make judgments about where things should go. Gotta look at it from a distance from time to time to figure things out. Hello. Hello. Yes. I did a picture and I use markers. Is okay? Of course. Okay, good. You're going to send okay. it to me to look at, right? Mm hmm Okay, good. All right. Thanks. All right. Thank you. 
You're welcome, Helen. Of course it's okay. We've got to use whatever we have available to us during the pandemic, right, everybody? Absolutely. Liz, I love the way your painting is coming along. Beautiful. I love the colors. Thank you. Fine. Thank you. You're going to have to share yours, too, so we can see it. Starting to add black, trying to be judicious with it. What time is it? So we have about, about 20 more minutes. I may stop a little bit early today so I can talk to you about the materials for the weaving class. And I do want to tell you the next artist. Do we have two Wednesdays left in March or one? Let's check. Two. Next week is the 24th and then the 31st. Good. Good, good. Thank you. Liz, would it be all right if I show you where I'm at? Of course. Just because uh, I feel like the first time I'm actually doing something that I am invested in. <laughs> That's wonderful to hear. All right. Yeah. The mycelium really did it for me. Oh, there you go. Wow. Love those touches of orange. Don't do too much with the orange. That was where I was going. I'm working with the orange now and I don't want to ruin it. So. I'm yes. going to suggest, Jane, a little bit in the, um, it's your right, I believe, your upper right hand corner. Yeah, just a little bit of orange up there and that may be enough. Okay, thank you. Nice. Anybody else ready to share? This is about you guys, not me. I'm only working on this painting because this is being recorded and no one can see anything but me. Anyone else want to share? I'm going to scroll through. Esty, you want to share? Wow. <gasps> Woo. I, I did it in um, Ibu style. <laughs> but I'm not done. It's, not, it's on glass. I, I'm not done yet. We'll see. Oh, I was wondering why it was. Wow. Wow. Okay. Awesome. Wow, what's going on here? Awesome. Yeah, okay, so I'm working. Now, yeah, he would tell you to fill in all the empty, but yeah, I yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, it. yeah, it's still soon. Yeah. Okay. All right, anyone else know me? I think I, I need a shrink after this um, class. Oh. I'm so stuck in a rut. I did the most realistic picture ever. Tell me, listen to me. 
Abstraction is incredibly difficult. You do not yes. need to shrink. It is. It's very and frustrating not to be able to fly. I. And it's very difficult for me to teach. That was the inspiration. Okay. And this is what I did. It's beautiful. Well, it's very realistic and I'm very frustrated. <laughs> Here's my suggestion. Keep adding layers to it. Is it watercolor? Yeah. Keep adding layers to it. Try not to smooth it out. Try and keep adding more brush stroke to it. Start trying to eliminate the outline. Paint over the outline. See what happens if you do that. Okay? I will. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? I have my thing from last week, if you want to look at that. <laughs> Margo, okay. My portrait. Hang on. <laughs> it's not letting me spotlight you for some reason. That's weird. Oh, wait. I've got to take my video on, put my video on. <laughs> That's oh. fine. All right. See it? You were wondering what the scale was. Oh, right. Yeah, this is excellent. Excellent, excellent. Maybe a little bit more shading Oops. up near the edge of the nose where you have this dark outline. You have a white space. No, other side. Yeah, there's a, a white space. Maybe the shadow should go closer to the edge of the nose. Right. And that, I think it's great. Okay. Blend, blend the nose, blend the shadow more into the cheek. Okay. This one? Yeah, yeah. Okay. He's a good looking guy. Yeah, he and is. Underneath the hat, on the top of his forehead, no, on the top of his forehead, I feel like it should be dark under there, much darker. Got, got shading, but it is not showing up very well. There we go. Can you see it? I would, I would make it even darker still. Okay. Like here, look at where my finger is. Can you see my what I'm doing? No, because you've got me spotlighted. Right, so that's true. Yeah. All right, so wait, I'm gonna go back to me. So here, under his hat, the top of his forehead, it should be right. darker, I think. Okay. Yeah, right here. All right. Let me, I just want to add, just want to show you that even when you think you're finished, you can still add something to your painting, everybody. I feel a need for something over here in my piece, so... I'm going to go with this blue green action. Maybe put a little something something over here. Uh, this is just out of curiosity. Will you be willing to share the picture of your friend from last week? Oh, not yet. <laughs> I kind of shoved it into a corner, Nomi. And Nomi, if you recall, I said the first one is never the right one. So I will, let's put it this way, I will share it with you eventually, but it usually takes me three or four portraits before I've hit upon the one I like. But I'm glad you asked that because you're going to force me to get to one that I like. Thanks. You're welcome.
Thing about the coming of spring, I've been missing her more than usual this month. So it may Liz, be yes, um, it, it's Karen. I um, okay. I've been trying to find uh, your um, the YouTube videos. Uh, of, yeah. of, of previous classes, for instance, the portrait class from yeah. last week that I, I really would, I missed it. And I, how do, how do you access those? Well, Heidi did mention at the beginning of this class that they have been having problems, apparently technical problems, um, getting them up. <clears throat> So I, I'm not, does anybody know how to do that? I, I'm assuming I we go to YouTube no. and then type in art at home. Hoboken. You can type um, know. on YouTube, Hello. you type in Hoboken Library. I'm and sorry, every, yeah. everybody, everybody seems to be talking. Um, and all your classes come up. Say that again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can you put that yeah. in the chat box? Sure. Mm -hmm. Great. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Hoboken Library. Yeah, and then you can read it. And Helen, what were you trying to say? I was saying the same thing you type in Hoboken Library and you could see it. Okay, great. So you go to mm -hmm. YouTube, you type in mm -hmm. Hoboken and Library Hoboken. and it comes up? Yes. Oh, okay. You go, mm -hmm. you go to YouTube and type in Hoboken Library. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. But you Heidi did it. mention they seem to be having some kind of problems with that lately. I think with the report, you could, go, you could go into Facebook too. You could also do it from the library website. Yeah. And also, Helen said also from Facebook. By yeah. the way, uh, if you get a video from me on Facebook, please don't open it. I've been hacked. <laughs> oh, okay. no. Good to know. Yeah. All right, folks, requests, can you mute? Everybody, please mute again. If you have a thought or question, you can always unmute. Thank you. Excuse me, Liz. Yes. I have a quick question. I feel a little bit stuck on mine. Um, Absolutely. I, Show me. I'm trying. It's like I said, it's an eye. And my thoughts were kind of the earth, outer space, like the virus. And um, where are you? And I feel perhaps I need some more definition or color or something. I don't know if the eye is being drawn. <laughs> no pun intended. Um, if the eye is being drawn to the whole thing, but it's kind of like, this is kind of an eye shape and we're seeing this foreign body, i.e. the virus, which it kind of put a couple out here like planets, like it's outer space, but I'm looking at it and I'm not sure if I see definition and or if this is crap. What do you think? I Yeah, that's I feel my like thought. It needs to be part of a part, a larger piece. Could okay. you find what is it on canvas? Well, this is a small canvas, but I was thinking of getting something about I don't know four times the size. I feel like it should be kind of like part and then, I don't know. I was thinking of like an abstract face as like an outer space type 
planetary situation, almost like a- Lauren, listen, it's so powerful. Really? I feel it needs to be in something bigger. So here's a suggestion. Can you take it off the stretcher bars and stitch it to a larger piece of canvas? Yeah, absolutely. And then work around it. Okay. Okay, great. Do you think this is a finished area? Yes, absolutely. Okay. When you stitch it to the larger canvas, I wouldn't put it in the middle. Okay, I was thinking to the corner, like maybe yeah, up yeah. here. Somewhere off center, yep. Great. Oh, thank you so much. Your input just means the world. Well, that's thank you. Literally, <laughs> the world. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. I hope it helps. Always, love truly. The colors, love the texture. You have to keep going on it, but it's overwhelming the size of the canvas, that's all. It's too powerful for the space you put it in. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Liz? Thank you. You're welcome. It's right. Somebody's calling me, but who are you? You've got to identify Heather. yourself. Shirley? Heather, Heather. Heather. Heather, yes. Okay, let me find you, please. Heather. Nice, you're on cardboard. Yes. Nice. Very plant-like. You were looking at a plant, perhaps? Yes, the colors look washed out because of the light. Uh, yeah, the lighting. The light from above. You, you have a skylight or something? Yeah, tilt it. Tilt it. I love this. I, yeah, there you go. That's I love better. This. I want more black outline, maybe, yeah. Yeah, that's you what know, I was you thinking. Know, you know what to do, Heather. It needs more heavy. Heavy black outline. I know, I don't have black, that's my problem. Well, oh. you can do it. You mix the three primary colors together. Uh-huh. Use the darkest blue and red you have. Okay. Okay, will do, thank you. You're welcome. Or, if you don't have black paint, do you have a black Sharpie? Um, yeah, but it was getting mucked up, I do have have the little black that I have in there is from a pastel, a black pastel. Maybe I'll go go over it with a bot, you know, like a. Yeah, maybe wait till it's dry. Yeah. I'll try the paint. Thanks. You're welcome. I did initially when I started with my darks, I didn't use black. I just mixed. Um, I don't know. I mixed all my colors together and got a, a very dark grayish brown. Mm. I got a lot of leftover paint here. Anybody want to come over? <laughs> I, I do. Wish could. I, I wish you could. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. So, Taylene, thank you. She typed in how to get to the YouTube videos. You can go to YouTube and type my name in and all my classes come up. Oh my God. Um, here's what I would say. Bad news. <laughs> okay. So here's, um. Oh, save your mind. All right. Okay. Wait, wait, honey, wait. Here we go. What? Replace spotlight. There we go. Wow. There's. This is what I made. I don't even know what that taught me. Wow. This is, but I just made it because I don't know. That was the first thing that just came up to mind. Love it. I love the big red background. It's so cool. Thanks. Really well done. And then my mom made one too. <laughs> And by the way, my mom made one. Wow, <laughs> this is terrific. <laughs> I, it's like I feather. Just used, I just used all the leftover colors that Ethan did. <laughs> well, that so this works. Is, this is what came up with. Yeah, those are sleep. Oh, <laughs> what? No, it's not 
supposed to look like anything, Mama. Well, kind of look. I, I feel a need for you to emphasize underneath. Underneath these shapes a little bit, just a little bit more black underneath each of um, the whitish gray shapes. Okay. But not too much because I like. I so much like the tiny black strokes, horizontal strokes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to get rid of them. Maybe on the back edge, like on the two? back edge, a little bit more black, just a little. Okay. Have any suggestions for mine? Yours <laughs> maybe it needs more guys in it. <laughs> okay, I'll put an eyeball. <laughs> yeah, an eyeball would work. Go for it. Thank you. More guys are more things, Ethan. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing. Anyone else want to share? Now's the time, because in a couple minutes, I want to talk about next week and the weaving class. Um, I need some help. Suzanne. Okay. Can you see? Yes. Uh, that's nice. I need, Suzanne, this is so gorgeous. Uh, I feel a need for something on the bottom. Okay. Something, maybe more of the earth tone on the bottom to ground it. Okay. Turn it for me vertically. Yeah, I like this better, but the other way. Oh, like this? Yeah, I love this. Okay. But then I have a question by your hand here. What is this? I have a question about. Or the other that side. That needs more definition. If you hold it this way, this yeah. fluffy shape here needs more definition. Which on your right hand. Yeah, right there. This needs more definition here if I do it this way. Yeah, this brown shape. Oh, here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was just fiddling with that, but you like it better this way. I have I love it that way. What does everybody think? I love it held vertically like that. I give a thumbs up. I agree. I like, I like, that vertically. I like it I like it vertically. Vertically? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. This is the beauty of abstraction. You can always turn it another direction and you have all new options. Yeah, that's for sure. It looks totally different. All right. I need to see who our next artist is. Can I show you where I've gotten to, Liz? Yeah, one sec. Okay. This will only take me a second. <clears throat> <I'm done. laughs> oh, you're going to love our fourth artist. Oh, she's so cool. All yeah. right. But first, we're going to talk about Jane's work. Here's a made a little progress. I added ochre. I added kind of the yellowish and toned down the orange. Oh, wow. It's completely different. <laughs> I think it's finished. Okay, because I was going to cover the rest of the white, but maybe uh, I should leave it. I wouldn't. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? So, there are a bunch of people I have not shared in a long time, so I want to be sensitive to everyone's needs. Susan, Shirley, Mika. Taylin. Okay, I'll share. Not my best work. Susan. Mm hmm Hey, we can't be Michelangelo for every single painting. Just saying. Mm -hmm. Fabulous color. I want you, I love the textural effect you did on these baskets or pots. Yeah. You need to do more of that on the other green pots. 
Okay. That's going to bring the whole thing to life. It's color resist. It's a, I use crayon watercolor, so I'll do some more of that. Oh, you did crayon resist. We haven't yeah. done that as a class in a while. We have to do that. Thank you for reminding me. This, okay. This just isn't finished, Susan. So okay. stop labeling and critiquing it at this point. You got yeah. a long way to go on it. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome.